cryptocurrency enthusiasts have shown up in droves. Over 8,500 people at this year's consensus conference compared to 650 that attended back in 2015. And it's been a wild event. Marketers seized on the event showcasing Lamborghinis, a favorite symbol of crypto wealth. There was even a parody protest organized by Bankers Against Bitcoin, a tongue-in-cheek way of reminding people of the disruptive, disruptive force blockchain could be for Wall Street. Now, on a serious note, St. Louis Fed President James Buller spoke and did not bash Bitcoin. Instead, he acknowledged that digital currencies are here to stay, though he does not think Bitcoin is a threat to the U.S. dollar. We think uh, blockchain technology is very interesting and of course there's been a lot of uh, new issuance of uh, cryptocurrencies so we're keeping an eye on that. Uh, so we want to be very engaged and uh, thoughtful about as this proceeds. Still, noteworthy investor Barry Silbert sees more money going into cryptocurrencies. Has finally discovered crypto and I think there's a tidal wave of capital that's about to flow into this asset class. And as if on cue, HSBC making news, announcing its first trade finance transaction using a single blockchain platform, which involved a shipment of soybeans from Argentina to Malaysia. So we're slowly starting to see more companies put blockchain to use. Melissa? All right, Seema, thank you. So uh, the question here is, is Wall Street starting to warm up to crypto? And Dan, we've been at a couple of Credit Suisse blockchain conferences, and James Disney over at Credit Suisse always talks about how the firm is looking at ways to use a blockchain in order to, yeah. to save time and, and actually save money. So there's so many things going on in crypto blockchain. Yeah. And when you think about like bankers and the guys that I speak to, especially guys like James at Credit Suisse, they're thinking about how they can advise companies to use this technology to kind of disintermediate certain processes that are going on, to cut out middlemen, that sort of thing. So to me, that's really what What's very interesting right now about blockchain, that last bit they just said, you know, it's a logistics thing. It wasn't that yeah. wasn't a crypto trade of soybeans that, you know, to Malaysia. It was tracking a shipment. Right. That and it could also disintermediate letters of credit. IBM and Maersk have a, a JV already. And, and that's that's really where we've been grappling on this desk. And I think people are trying to look at companies and, and, and drop in a, a blockchain framework and how it's going to change their business. I mean, bottom line is it's going to bring some companies to the center of their industries. There's obviously industries building around it. Um, but for now, uh, unfortunately, we're not really able to see who's doing and what and I think playing this on the stock by stock is really you know I, I think there are people that are out there doing that but I think the best way to do it is look at the people that are changing the landscape on the inside all right let's bring in Arthur Hayes the co-founder and CEO of BitMEX the Bitcoin mercantile exchange which is the largest crypto trading exchange by volume in a former life by the way he was a top trader for Citigroup so uh, Arthur it's great to get your analysis here Thanks on the subject me. welcome to the show um, so tell us a little bit about BitMEX you deal primarily with institutional traders, correct? No, we deal primarily trades? with retail traders. Retail, in okay. North, North Asia. So uh, our premise is that we want to give access to financial products to retail investors around the world using crypto. And right now that's Bitcoin. And so we offer highly leveraged derivatives, um, 100 times leverage we offer on the Bitcoin. 100 times leverage. Correct. And our uh, perpetual swap product is the most liquid trading product around the world. It does about three and a half yards a day of flow. Okay. So, so when we say it's by volume, it's because you're dealing with the retail trader, correct? And so they're presumably not trading the volume, the, the dollar amounts that institutions are. Well, there's really not that much institutional presence right yeah. now in uh, crypto. It is a retail -a phenomenon. Are you equipped to handle institutional trades once that floodgate starts coming in, as, as so many people are predicting? Absolutely. You know, we have an API. People can code against it. And you have a lot of prop shops and algo guys who've joined in because it's volatile, uh, there's negative correlation to a lot of other asset classes, and they actually trade against real humans instead of robots all day. The New York Stock Exchange just announced recently that it was going into also uh, cryptocurrency trading, settling trades, and one of the biggest pieces was the custodial aspect. You have that figured out though, correct? You have well, we, we hold Bitcoin, we hold right. you know, a large amount of Bitcoin. Uh, we have certain processes that we believe have made us safer than others in certain ways we do things. But at the end of the day, you still have to take that risk if you want to trade. Do you think um, that there's a risk, Arthur, to, you just said 100 times leverage, and it's yeah. retail. And that's something that we know has been a real problem, especially in risk asset booms, right? I mean, how do you arrive at 100 times and, and what's suitable? And, and is that something that is transferable to the United States? You said you're in Asia right now. 
Yeah, so really it's a headline number. Most traders do not use 100 times leverage. So last time I checked, it was around eight and a half times leverage. So a lot of people use that as a testing ground or almost like a free option, if you will. I think the price is going to go up in the next 10 minutes. Let me place a little trade. If I hit it, great. I made 100% ROE. If I don't, I just lose my initial margin. So it's, it's limited liability from the perspective of the trader. So unlike, you know, you go short XIV and you get carried out and you got to sell your house, uh, on BitMEX, you just lose what you put in. Arthur, kind of thematically, you talked about Asia, and clearly there's a ton of volume, and, and some are arguing that's two-thirds of the market. Why is that? And, and what do you see in terms of the U.S. retail presence in crypto in the near horizon? Well, I think Asia dominates crypto because they're very used to trading digital assets. So take South Korea, for example. They've been trading digital goods related to video games for almost two decades. So when you move to a purely money-based digital currency, they understand that culturally, and so they grapple, they you know, get on board um, quickly. Take that to the West, where you have a very established banking system, and things you know, work pretty well. Why do you need to go out and find a new way to trade or a new way to do things? You have a you know, broker that offers you options, futures, all sorts of different products. So you move that into the developing markets, where you don't have these type of products, and you see people who are a lot more interested in it. You've got a stunning Bitcoin forecast. Where do you see it going? 50,000 by the end of the year. By the end of the year? Correct. Now, in January, were you a little bit wobbly about that prediction? No. <laughs> no it's my job to make predictions. Whether or not they're right or wrong doesn't really matter to me. Oh, so you acknowledge them. Yeah. <laughs> you might be totally off base. Parker, welcome to the show. <laughs> yeah. You could be one of us, yeah. I guess. <laughs> what, what, why is that? Well, I'm a, I'm a volatility trader at the end of the day. Uh, we make our money if it's volatile. If it goes up, if it goes down, if you have, you know, Bill Gates calling it a fraud or it's, we're harvesting babies, like, great. It means short it. I don't care. Or if you think it's going to be a million dollars in a few months, great. Buy it. Still don't care. We get matched trades. Arthur, hope you'll come back. Thank you. Fascinating to learn awesome. about your business. Arthur Hayes of BitMEX. Just matched trades. I mean, it's interesting. But Dan like made the correlation between, and it's a great business, I'm sure they're killing it, but he made the correlation between is now gambling being legal going to hurt? I mean, in a lot of ways, what you're doing there, you're the man, I'm not bringing the guest back, but he's the middleman of, a ga right, of people good. gambling, basically, which is fascinating. Right. And again, don't underestimate people. As long as a transaction happens, you make money. So here's, here's the irony. One, one of the reasons why crypto traders love it is because they're, they're inefficient markets. There is enormous volatility. And, and it's, there's been you know, a lack of price you know, see-through. That's how you make money, or at least that's how you can make money, as long as you're on the right side of the trade. So if you think about institutional players getting involved, that should start to go away in a regulatory environment. The efficiency of these markets should be enormous. And a lot of people who want blockchain don't want it for the volatility. And, you know, you call store of value and this and that. That's one of the big debates that's out there. Tell you what I loved hearing. Arthur's a brother from another for me right now, and, and for you, I hope, way. because the whole idea of this being a derivatives opportunities oh, here yeah. and your limited risk to buying something that you think is going to go fly into the upside. I mean, it, it's the options world that we that we work it, in right it is, now. You know, with I, liquidity. I, I'm kind of more in Tim's camp. I mean, this is my very solid belief that it, it is is gambling that doesn't have regulatory framework, and we're just talking about you know gambling that's existed forever. And people on want sport. that. I know, but I, and, and I think right now when you're thinking about the volatility, there's a lot of stuff going on. You know, remember remember stock trading before Reg FD, that sort of thing. There's information arbitrage that's going on, and I think there's very few people that have all the information in the crypto space right now. So to me, but I, I that's think it's still true. Well, I'm just saying it's a bit of a opinion. it's a rigged game. Okay, so I, you know uh, we could never go out to somebody and say you should trade at 100 times leverage, and you're, even if you're risking what you're willing to lose, what are you basing it on? A feeling, a gut? You wake up this morning, Bitcoin's going back yeah. above 10,000. I don't know, maybe. Well, and it seems to me, and, and you know, Arthur didn't sound like he was that convicted to call 50,000. He cares more yeah. that there's enormous volatility in a sector where his company is well positioned to do it. But but that almost seems to be the story. The story is that at least for a couple of the core vehicles that people can play that trade actively, you know, oh. let it rip. He let sucked it rip. me in right away. Maybe part of the story is the picks and shovels as opposed to the that's, end product. That's the right. Way. I mean, in terms of investing in this space, it's good to trade and the going, shovels. Right. No, but he's not mining for gold. Make money he's not mining for gold. He, I mean, and what he, said, he doesn't even care if it gets to 50000 Yeah, but there's no that, exchanges that, in the U.S. that are allowing people to do 100 times leverage for good reason. They know that our regulators would be all would over that be. in a half they a second. Would.
Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.